I'm a yoga teacher. Thank you, Max Thomas, Ganga, and for the last 30 years, Gary Crafso. I'm a yoga teacher. I will be a yoga teacher till the day I die. I've been joking for a few years. If I ever move into a senior center, I'm going to be teaching chair yoga to all of those other old people. But it's the students that I've had. Did you know uh, Constantine Aronis? Yeah. He's now, he turned 91 a few months he's still, ago. He's oh been my, my student for over 25 years. Yeah. I'm never going to, Constantine is never going to come to one of my classes again. As a yoga teacher, after you've been doing it a while, every so often a student on their way out of class will say, not just thank you, but you changed my life. And even less often, someone's going to say, thank you. You saved my life. I used to teach a Thanksgiving morning class because I like teaching it. A few years back, one of my students said, Fred, thank you for coming out of the holiday and teaching a yoga class. I said, you're welcome. And what you guys don't understand is I get more out of this than you do. I'm a yoga teacher. I'll be a yoga teacher the rest of my life. And it all started 37 years ago at the Center for Yoga. And that's what's gone. I have a lot of respect for Fred Miller for many reasons. I remember we would see each other in the crossover because I would be leaving on Sundays after my 8.30 a.m. class as he would be arriving to teach. Sometimes we would meet on the stairs. Sometimes I would go in the small room if it was open and do my own practice and Fred would come in and I observed him making a sacred space for himself and through meditation, prayer, movement and breath practices so that he could be absolutely present but also that his teaching would come from an authenticity directly from his own practice. I will forever credit Jan Halpern and Sally Lloyd for the start of my teaching career at Center for Yoga. Through whatever encouragement, support, conversations, coercion, emails with Lisa Hasi, who was the manager at the time, they kept saying my name. I think Lisa knew that the center was soon to change hands into the Yoga Works fold, and she gave me my first class on the schedule in 2004, it was actually one of her classes, she gifted me Goddess Lisa, where I taught, studied, practiced, loved for nearly 15 years. But not only did he help me through the door, Jan Halpern remains in my memory as an integrated piece of the center's community because I felt like I was arriving home when I heard his voice echo in the space as I walked up the steps, or in a story, something interesting he read or some piece of music that he was listening to. I reached out to both of them around the same time for this project because I feel like they are the keepers of history. Fred has been teaching at the center since the mid 80s and has pretty much taught consistently through the years until its closure this year. And Jan, because of his unique mind, his interesting observations, knowledge to detail and history, that I thought the two of them would make for a good conversation. And they were able to answer some of my questions about early history and the original layout where there was a living space upstairs. And Fred was able to answer the mysterious question, the mystery of why there are so many weird staircases in that building. Hey, Kim. Hi. How you doing, kid? All right, how are you? Good, all is well. Good. All things considered. Yeah. 
Are you still in LA? Yes, in North Hollywood Studio City-ish. Nice. So, as soon as the pandemic hit, my daily schedule just evaporated. I don't drive into Hollywood to Larchmont anymore, and the other things that seemed to be a necessity just went away. The first couple of months, I was truly social distancing, which was just dandy with me. I mean, I've got a couple of books off the bookcase from the I'll get to these someday section, and so we've done that. I read with, uh, with Gary Craftso and uh, three Zoom sessions. We've redone my private practice, which is hour and 15, hour and a half, and about 15 minutes of it are asana. The rest of it is a combination of chanting, prayer, ritual, etc. So I was living the life of a monk, as I have joked many times, and, and quite happy about it. Right now, I have a cat on my lap. And that's both the, a combination of joy and annoyance is this cat. <laughs> Isn't that the pandemic, though? I had a yoga teacher say during the pandemic, my yoga teacher said, spread your toes like you're trying to get away from your family members, but you can't. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I thought that was great. Oh, my yeah, God. Absolutely. When did you start teaching at the center? I had been a Tai Chi student for a couple of years and then was an Aikido student. I was part of a, of a meditation energy group of people, a Saturday afternoon workshop at the Center for Yoga. I went, this is about this time of year, fall 1980. I had no interest in yoga. I dated a woman that went to Shivananda. It was boring. I didn't want to chant. I only went for the free food on Sunday night. So an hour into this two-hour workshop, I'm standing in puddles of my own sweat. There was quite a big uh, Iyengar influence from Ganga. After he left Shivananda, he studied with I Iyengar in, in India. So a lot of standing poses, holding, etc. And I said, okay, well, this seems like a pretty good idea. Before the end of the year rolled around, I was a regular student there. Okay, Max Thomas was managing at the time, and he lived upstairs, and I'll get into what that looked like whenever you want. Yes. And I took classes from Lisa Walford, from Diana, Scott Hobbs was teaching there, and Chad was teaching there. They'd all been through the Ganga Anna teacher training which essentially was the Shivananda teacher training, which Ganga had taught many times, and Anna did the work, workouts. So that's, that's pretty much how that was, uh, was done. After a couple of years, Max Thomas says to me, you ought to take the teacher training. And I said, I don't want to be a yoga teacher. He said, do you want to learn more about yoga? I said, yes. He said, then take the teacher training. So in the spring of 83, I took what became the very last Ganga White Anna Forest taught teacher training at the Center for Yoga. And the reason for that, there's Jan H. There you are. There I am. Sorry, Fred was in the middle of telling us the story of him teaching. It's the first time I was on the schedule, November of 83. And Sorry, you, you taught for free like at the Center for Yoga. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the way it was set up by Ganga. That's the way it ran. What I got was free classes. Right. Yep. So before I was a teacher, I either paid for classes, and when I couldn't pay for classes, among other things, I painted the big room one time for Max Thomas because it needed doing, which was, you know, what I mean. Right. Like forever. So that, that was the beginning for me. What was the vibe? What did it feel like? What were people doing that felt special about yoga that drew you to yoga at that time? There was a macrobiotic restaurant on Melrose, just east of Fairfax. Yeah. And behind it was a macro restaurant. Now, Mati worked there. I'm pretty sure she cooked in the restaurant also. I don't know, either taking classes, something like that. Essentially, they lived in a van, the two of them. Uh, if you don't know Eugene, he was a good 20, maybe 25 years older than Mati. 
So, and again, we're, we're in the era of live-in managers. When Max moved out, a guy named Baba Hal, who he used to be a, a shoe salesman. And then he was the manager of Yoga Works. And before long, it was Mati and Eugene living upstairs. And Ganga comped Mati through the teacher training. They, in fact, were the managers right after the earthquake that required all of the retrofitting that went on and for that brick building and hundreds of others in the city of Los Angeles. And was it, a, was it Patty Townsend and Alan that who opened up Yoga Works? Because I think she was the one who came up to me. She said, I was, I was the actual founder. I was the founder. Hmm. Well, she knew uh, Alan... Alan Finger. She had been his student when he had a place on Melrose and Robertson years okay. and years ago. The way I know the story is the troika of yoga works in the one room upstairs on Montana was Alan Finger, who had a following and yeah. some money, and Patty Townsend and Mati. Okay. And within six or nine months, Alan Finger decided he wanted to move to New York. Ganga had Patabi Joyce come to the yoga center. And that night in the big room, there were 60 people, which is the most people that had ever been in there before, followed by a week long retreat workshop intensive up at White Lotus. So that means by this time, Ganga had gotten the White Lotus property from Yogi Hegel. Chuck Miller was driving Patabi Joyce and his wife in his van to various places in the United States. Chuck was an Ashtanga student. He learned it out of a book. He'd been to India and studied with Patabi. So he was up there for that week. And that's his introduction to the Southern California yoga scene, as it were. And then there's some confluence of Chuck and Mati and then some exits of Eugene and Patty Townsend. And then suddenly the legend is it's Yoga Works founded by Mati and Chuck Miller. And did you go upstairs into the living space when, when it was like apartments? Do you know what it looked like up there? Yes and yes. When you walked in the door, there was a wall coming straight out that divided the entire room. In fact, if you had ever noticed when you were teaching up there, you can see the mark in the floor where the wall used to be. And then on this side, there was maybe a quarter of that whole space, which was a bedroom. The rest of the room was a living room. Down by the French doors, right at the end of that wall was a door into a kitchen. Uh, this was part of Jake's stuff. He filled that in and then cut the outside door for it to become an office. But there was, a, there was a six burner wolf stove. There was a big refrigerator in there. You asked about it being a Masonic lodge. Yeah. There are old pictures that have been dug up. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a plaque downstairs. It was, the place was built sometime in the mid twenties. It was dedicated to something and I can't remember what, knowing just about that much about Masons, they have dinners there. To me, the dinners were prepared in the kitchen and brought down the back stairway. So that back stairway was put in when the place was built, a non-public passageway from the top floor down to the large room. That makes so much I, sense, Fred. Thank you for explaining. Can I add something? The first year of the, of the Masons, the first members, was 1926. Wow. It was the year after the building opened. I understood that the Masons were the original owners. Wow. Okay, cool. Or a member who was a Mason. A lot of the people who were who had means in LA, they would be Masons. It's was only been three things. Okay. It's been a Masonic Hall from this is this is what Lisa Hassi told me. A Fred Astaire dance studio and a yoga studio. Right. And in almost ninety-five years. When Fred Astaire closed in seventy four, that's when Ganga, who had the studio the space was available and so uh again i don't know what the configuration of the space was like but that's the telling of it by lisa hasi it was that that ganga jump he was getting so popular that he needed to expand and so he took a chance and took over that space 
That's so cool. Those pictures I sent you are the earliest that I can find so far. But it's mm. kind of amazing. I don't know if you took a look at them. You can see the Center for Yoga from that angle, which I find yeah, okay, amazing. Yeah. And my other question about that period of time, which you may or may not have any idea, there was a Larchmont Theater. Yep. Where was that? I believe the Larchmont Theater was where Blockbuster ended up being. Oh. Yeah. Dan, when did you start working at the center and what drew you to go there? I started practice, practicing yoga in 1996 in Seattle, quote unquote, serious practice in 99 because I was doing gym yoga from 96 to 99. And then I had bought into my brother's business, which was located on, on Larchmont Boulevard. I moved next door on Larchmont Boulevard. So it was the yoga studio down the street. Right. That's simple. Uh, I started volunteering in 2000. Through a good chunk of Jake Johansson's ownership, they were still not paying people. And then uh, they asked me in 2002, hey, you know, somebody quit on the spot. And uh, Gary asked me, hey, do you want to do you want to work front desk for a shift or two? I said, uh, yeah, sure. I can probably do it with the other thing I'm doing. So uh, I started in September of 2002 as an employee. And then when did you leave? I was at the Larchmont location until uh, actually it was June. Now I'm remembering now. It was June of, it was June of 2010. I, um, I, I badly injured my, my, lower, my lower back uh, because of something that happened. And um, that space, that two foot by two and a half foot space, which I'm again, maybe slightly understating, that front desk space was just really not helping me heal. So I left, started working at, uh, at Yoga Works Main Street. Wow. And Fred, you had been teaching from, what was it, 1983, 1986 to yeah. current? Are, was that like you were teaching the whole time? Almost. Wow. I mean, periodically there were breaks. I was working on a television show in, in the middle of 83 and taking classes and that's when Max talked me into to taking a teacher training. So I left the show. I quit that job like a week before teacher training started. And I knew I was going to have to get some recuperation time between the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And with Anna, I think I'd already taken an, uh, an intensive or two with Anna. Before that, she would periodically do that. Or at least she did after that teacher training, after the Anna Ganga breakup, which meant for Ganga with Anna leaving, now he had to do some kind of a workout. And this is just observation. It's, it, never, it did not come from a conversation with Ganga. Anna did very intensive workouts. And Ganga liked that for the teacher trainees to go through. So what Ganga did, this is again, just observation. He took the primary series, the first series of Ashtanga, and eliminated about two thirds of the more challenging poses. So it became what he named flow yoga. And that was the beginning of flow. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. What did you yeah. guys love about the center? How did you feel about it closing its physical doors? You want to see me cry right now? I have cried more over that than a couple of dogs that died. More than wow. any human being, relatives included. Yeah. And the knot is still there and it comes and goes. I'm heartbroken. Yeah. As they say, I'm fucking heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah, I, the first thing I did was I went to Google Earth. <laughs> I took that tour too. I, I did to that Google too. Earth. I went in the studio. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hadn't. I hadn't. Um, yeah. I thought. Oh, I haven't. I hadn't been there in a while. Let me take one last uh, tour. On that Sunday afternoon in late September, I got an email from Barbara Ream, one of the yeah. last remaining Yoga Works executives saying that I was invited to come to the Center for Yoga. I could pick a 30 minute time to be there and no more than 10 people to sign up and get your space. And I didn't know what was going on until I got there. And it was a funeral. It was a wake. Right. I asked her if Yoga Works was going to maintain the leases somehow. 
And she said, they have given up every one of their leases. A real estate agent has already shown this space. If LA is anything like San Francisco, they have left a lot of stuff behind. The, the, cast, the cast situation is so dire that they couldn't even bring in 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Well, I had been gone for two years and I had a proper goodbye. You know, I knew when it was my last class, my students knew. I haven't set foot there in two years and I feel completely heartbroken. Mm. It's like a love of my life, you know? Exactly. And it anchored all of us together in this really unique, beautiful, crazy way. Yeah. You know, I was in denial when things were starting to go down, like, oh, they'll keep they'll keep Center for Yoga and they'll keep Montana and they'll keep Main Street, but they'll let go of the other ones. Even not being there, I mean, Fred, it it feels like she's an old friend of mine. There's something about that space. And so this is what this project is for, is to collect stories, to collect memories as an oral history, though Mm -hmm. the Center for Yoga and this era of our time of yeah. being there as a as a yoga center, though that space is closed, that we can keep that spirit alive. And and so here's the question, and you might not answer it tonight. You may think about it and let me know your thoughts. It was its own space. And the question that I have about this space, was it the people or was it something about that building which was so weird with the stairs and the trap door and the dial for the light you know there was so many quirks about that building that made it so unique and the other big change i think was when yoga works came in without going into too much detail there was a ca- there was a serious cash flow issue mm-hmm. uh there was a time magazine article prompted many people to take up yoga at the beginning of 2003, if I remember correctly. And I clearly remember so many people com- coming in after the first um, of, of January had a really great 2003. 2004 was not going as well. There are some other issues. There was, there was too much money being spent. Well, that's sort of when I joined the Center for well, Yoga Community, but there was yeah. a big uprising. People were mad. People were yeah. afraid. And if you remember your feelings around like when Yoga Works came and, and how things changed at the center after that. The whole yoga community was, oh my God, make yoga, etc. Right. That's exactly what it was. Now it was corporate yoga, slight backup. Jake got tired of putting money into the Center for Yoga. He hadn't been there in years. He hadn't practiced yoga in years. To the point to where one of one of Diana Beardsley's students paid to have the small room floors refinished. They were so bad because Jake wouldn't do it. He just gave the lease to Lisa Hasse yeah. to get out from underneath it. The rumors, of, I'll qualify this, that I heard was Yoga Works called Lisa Hasse and made an offer. At the time, Center for Yoga was doing fine, and she said no. And Um, sometime later, it was in the red, and she called them. And according to George at the time, in a staff meeting, teacher meeting, he says, believe us, we have a lot more yoga studio people calling us saying please buy my studio then we're calling them looking for studios they were on a buying spree and they had the money to do it and the theory behind it was if we have enough then the studios that are doing well can carry the ones that aren't doing so well and it'll all come up and then it'll high title float all studios etc yeah, we were actually the second studio they bought. The first studio they bought was Westwood. LA Yoga Westwood. LA Yoga, right. Mark Stevens was a, a, a revered teacher. I uh, won't we'll go into the details as to why he had to sell, but he was forced to sell. And pretty much, he was pretty much um, banished from the yoga community for a few years. Well, according to George, that was just a walk away. They took over his lease. There was no money exchange. He, oh, really? He just yeah. was walking away. He was persona, persona non grata. To jump back and set the scene in Los Angeles, when I got there, Anna was not on the schedule because mm-hmm. she was living in Santa Barbara with Ganga. She would do workshops and co-teach the teacher training. I took classes with Chad Hamron 
I took classes with Scott Hobbs. I took classes with Lisa Walford. I took classes with Diana Beardsley. And those are the ones that I can remember that names that, that you might remember because they're still around. So there wasn't a lot of yoga in the day. And Ganga had designated it as a, as a spiritual, non-religious place to be because he'd just gotten away from Shivananda. Yeah, by the time I got there, yoga was, was in full bloom in L.A. up, and now they're all, they're all closing. What do you think the legacy of Center for Yoga will be? Oh, it's just the, a special place, and, it, and it's a combination of, yes, the building. There's no other yoga studio like it only because of the building and the place that it was in. It was a library downstairs in the small room. There were yeah. carpets on the floor. There were some chairs. The back wall was, was a complete bookcase, et cetera. It was a library. The big room was the only room. Frank White took away a whole bunch of books that had been at the center. He told me that uh, because he brought the books back when he was in, in the last year of his life many of which had been part of the library, many of them very, 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 very dog-eared. <laughs> yeah. And written in. Jan, what do you miss about the center? Do you ever think about it? Yeah, I, I think about it all the time. Like Fred said, there was a singularity about it. There was nothing like it. What I miss about the center for yoga, it had an ineffable quality. You know, I liked the community, especially when I went to other studios at some point, I thought, okay, I, I need to check out other studios just to compare. When Mati owned it, it wasn't, it didn't have the corporate sheen that it took on when capital management company that effectively owned uh, Yoga Works. We need to dress it up a little bit to make it more appealing. George was yeah. a student of Jasmine Lieb. Yeah. So he was a yoga student and he and Rob had sold Ask Jeeves or something like that. There'd been offers for forever. Yoga Works was a cash cow. I mean, yep. you weren't going to become a billionaire, but there was a lot of cash coming through it. And eventually, Mati saw the right people with the right amount of money. People hated yep. Mati because she was yep. such a good business person. Little did they know what was coming after. A good portion of the money was from the guy that started 24-hour fitness. That mentality is what infused from the beginning was the gym mentality because that's the way to run a business where people come and take classes and do physical things Let, yeah. let's go back to the heartbreak here <laughs> yeah i have emails for a couple dozen of my students which i've been in contact with a couple of times what that means is there are some scores of people that i have no way of touching base with again ever that's part of the heartbreak part of the legacy Laura Bogner took the teacher training and eventually Glendale Yoga. Elise Briggs went through the teacher training and she was yoga at the village, the other end of Glendale, which eventually I understand Laura is now in. The couple, Jonathan and Juliet, a long yeah. time ago, Silver Lake Yoga. Yeah. And that's just a little bit of the legacy that I know, let alone all of the others that, that have gone out and it's there. Absolutely, Fred. And how many other teachers that, you know, you say one little thing and it affects the trajectory of, of all the decisions of their life or becoming a yoga teacher or studying yoga and making it a part of their daily practice of centering. And sooner or later, what's going to come back is not corporate fucking yoga, but it's going to be mom and pop yoga places. And that's going to be a good thing. And I'm going to go back to the way I started teaching yoga, which is to say, anybody that opens a mom and pop yoga studio, I'm going to say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Teach classes, do a workshop. I'm not looking for a job. I don't want to get paid. I want to help you get this business up and running. And that's part of the legacy of Center for Yoga. Are you interested yeah. in the Frank White story from my... Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is the way I remember it. What I do know is I knew Frank in a writers and actors group in Hollywood. So we knew each other socially. He knew I was a yoga teacher. At one point, he started talking about yoga. And I said, well, why don't you come to the center and take a couple of my classes? It's on me. So I we was City College. You said that in the email. And I don't remember that. 
But that doesn't mean yeah. it didn't happen, just because I don't remember it. Okay, because that's, that's the story he told me, was that his first class was at City College. Actually, the beginning of our first yoga conversation was he didn't like what he was doing. He'd hurt himself. The teacher had hurt him, something like that. Mm. And I said, okay, come and take a couple of my classes, which he did. And from there, he, he branched out and started taking everybody's classes. And then he settled into the ones that he liked. And we were in the changing room one day. He'd been there for months and months. I said, Frank, will you do me a favor? Will you start a savings account? And he said, why? I said, because a year from now, you're going to be taking the teacher training. And you're going to need yeah. that money to pay for it. She said you were the one who spurred him on to become a teacher. Exactly. Yeah. And then look at look at that legacy. I mean, there's a half a dozen or a dozen or more people that became teachers because Frank. Yeah. This isn't about Frank. It's not about me. It's about yoga. It's about the generational, the passing on, the teacher to the student who becomes a teacher to more students, etc. This is all about yoga. By the way, this is uh, Frank's centennial, uh, 2020. Oh. As horrible as this, as horrible as this year was, he was born in 1920. Wow. He became a teacher at 68. Yeah. Yeah. And James Morrison is is one of his proteges. Absolutely. And that Sunday at Yoga Works, I asked Gene Heilman to uh, take down that picture of Frank and give it to Rich, who's very close with James. And oh, I said, yeah. well, get that picture to James, because I mean, I'm sure there's other people, but I, I know he would treasure that. Back to what students tell you. A regular student for a couple of years in my Sunday class, 50 years old, give or take a couple of things. Architect, high-end, single-family homes. After a couple of years, he says, you know, there's a, there's a very spiritual quality to, to your classes here. I really appreciate that, and I want to thank you. A year later, 50-year-old man, he comes back and he says, you have sparked me so much. I just want you to know, last week, I had my bar mitzvah. So it isn't about Hinduism or Buddhism. It's about stirring up something in people that they are then drawn to go deeper into what's already vibrating inside of you. Retirement age woman, casting director, had been coming for months and months, brought a friend who was just, I don't mean physically, I mean emotionally, the face, terrible, terrible shape. Three years later, which wasn't all that long ago, actually, on the way out of class, she said, I just want you to know that the first time that Jane brought me to your class, I was one day off suicide watch at UCLA. And she came to two, three classes a week for those years. But she was saying thank you to me. So that's one of the every once in a while, you saved my life. That's what I get out of being a yoga teacher. And I also loved what you wrote in your email, why you're not teaching in the virtual space. I think you said, I choreograph every breath because of who's in the room. And you can't really get that from this platform. That's the hallmark of Vinny Yoga. Yes, Jan. Thank you. <laughs> I'm teaching only two classes right now because things are hard. And I have to say, looking on the Brady Bunch screen, if they set their mat side to side and I can see their body at a distance, I actually can teach alignment really well because I, I don't have to walk around the room in a three-dimensional form. I can just see the grid. Like my eyes are going like this the whole time. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and like, oh, t do that with your leg. And, you know, obviously it's not an ideal situation, but it's creating in somewhat of an intimacy that I'm letting them see my bedroom. That's where I can film the long distance, <laughs> you know, and wherever they're letting me in, you know, the kitchen or their living room or, you know, and so here's my next question for both of you. What do you predict is the future after this fucking pandemic is over? Are we done teaching yoga? Is the mom and pop situation going to revitalize the yoga scene? How do you see us coming out on the other side? Mom and pops will come back, maybe not immediately, but it's going to be starting from ground zero. I can't imagine anybody has been able to sustain their lease or has had a landlord that has said, oh, don't worry about six months rent. 
Who knows? <laughs> There's a, a small chain, SF uh, Yoga Flow. They found out that I had worked for Yoga Works for 16 years. I just happened to run into one of the co-owners. And, and he said, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're doing the opposite of Yoga Works. We're, yeah, yoga Works is contracting. We're expanding. And they want to get more into the workshop space. So they are actually going to be leasing a couple of Yoga Works' is old, uh, Yoga Works' yoga, yoga Trees' old properties up here. Excellent. So, so the folks who have the capital to continue paying the rent, when mom and pops open up, the the, the studios that are in existence now are the ones who have a own lot of the capital, building, <laughs> you know, or own the building, or have very, 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 very generous landlords, which almost happened up here in San Francisco. The Yoga or San Francisco location, uh, they were almost able to work out a deal. But then when a timeline was established for reopening the landlord, the landlord's a great guy. I mean, I got to know him. When it was established that it might be a year before we could even consider physical classes, he finally said, yeah, I can't wait a year. Yeah. What's the future of yoga? Well, it'd be great if a lot of, a lot of the bad yoga died out. <laughs> Thanks to this, I mean, in one in in the macro version, what's happening here is a thinning of the herd worldwide and in America. Okay, that it just is. That's happening in the in our little yoga world. Although our yoga world is coast to coast, and it ain't so little. I mean, hopefully, the bad yogis and the bad yoginis and the bad yoga will find something else to do. End of the Frank White story is. In the last couple of years of his life, he was lamenting to me that he wanted to get more education. He said, I don't want to be a flow teacher for the rest of my life. Because oh, yeah. all he'd ever done was Ganga's teacher training. Yep. He wanted to learn more. It'd be great if more people learned more so they had better knowledge to be able to teach. And he incorporated the Qigong. So you remember how popular his classes were? Oh yeah. When yeah. when he brought Qigong to his flow classes, effectively slowing down his classes, he lost so many people. He lost the people who who just liked aggressive of, type uh, A personalities. Yeah. It's yeah. a deranged, which is why yeah. they need <laughs> yoga. Yep, exactly. Okay. Not a a gymnasium. Yeah. Steve Walter did the same thing. He brought some more Vinny yoga elements into the teaching and he really slowed the class down. And these classes where he used to draw 40, 50 people, he was lucky if he was drawing 20 people. If Center for Yoga cannot be a yoga space, what would you want it to be? Oh, don't ask that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. I don't want to see it, whatever it is. Ashley Rudeau came up with this brilliant idea it can't be a furniture store because they can't get the furniture up and down the steps it would be right. too inconvenient back to a uh, arthur murray dance studio well, at least a quarter to a third of the storefronts on larchmont are vacant it's bad village pizza is, is about ready to go chevalier's wow. bookstore is moving across the street into a smaller space for more rent than they're currently paying because they couldn't afford the increase that the landlord where they've been, that place was there 37 years ago. That bookstore was there when I started on Larchmont. To get back to the, to the question about what's gonna happen with yoga, I think that you're gonna see what's happening here already. People who have the space, who have like extra rooms, are like kind of like like diana beardsley did or does or did i don't know if she's still doing it have you thought about contacting gary and christine yes they're on my list okay but they're doing well liberation is doing great i hear oh, I, I don't know how to, so? i do it now Outdoors? they've got like a oh, rooftop. They they've got yeah. the garden the and the rooftop studio. so i was talking with uh jacqueline sally and katie who said how unusual that they were heartbroken when they could not buy Center for Yoga during the, the Yoga Works turnover, but they have the surviving space now. Yeah. But they've got a big outdoor space where they can have excellent, great for them. Yeah. Fred, thank you so much. Um, Happy to. My Jan, pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you both. <laughs>